Welcome back to If I Knew You Better. I'm Brendan Davis, your host, and my guest today is Stephen J. Katz, who I will be calling Steve from this point forward. Steve has possibly the most eclectic resume of anyone I've ever spoken to. And yes, that sounds like hyperbole, and no, I am not kidding. This is pretty wild. When I did the edit on this interview and made notes about all the different things, I thought, well, I can mention this, I can mention that. This is a summary. This is a short, not comprehensive summary, but it gives you an idea of the, the, the span, the breadth, and the depth of his background, which is pretty amazing. So his influences as an artistic person started back in the 1960s. He grew up with Ray Harryhausen and Famous Monsters magazine. But growing up in Westport, Connecticut, he was around the world of artistic and literary folks such as Paul Newman, Joanne Woodward, and the Westport County Playhouse. And he started sneaking in and then actually was able just to walk right in and watch rehearsals with visiting directors from New York like Woody Allen, for instance. And all these influences growing up like this, and he had very supportive parents, that brought him into this artistic life from the very beginning. He had a cousin in New York and learned film cameras and specifically the process known as rear projection, which he talks about in the in the episode with me, in New York City, working on TV shows like Car 54, Where Are You?, which is kind of a classic. He moved from that into putting together psychedelic light shows in New York at places like the Fillmore East. And over the next few years, he worked with bands like The Grateful Dead, The Doors, The Birds, Sly and the Family Stone, starting all this at age 19. He became a bluegrass banjo player and was quite good and actually thought about being professional until he realized that there were probably two people in the world who made their living as a professional bluegrass banjo player at a level where you would support yourself like he wanted to. But through a series of circumstances, he befriended a young John McTiernan, the legendary director of Die Hard, etc., and worked on his first film. He met and became friends with writing legend Michael O'Donohue, who was not quite a legend at that time, but he was one of the originators of the show Saturday Night Live, the man who uttered the very first line as a writer, performer, occasional performer on SNL. And Steve caught his first really, really, really giant break with seeing this this short film he put together that's kind of famous called The Clams. It's a spoof on the birds from Hitchcock. This opened a season of Saturday Night Live. So this gave him a big break as a TV writer, got him represented with, you know, agent and manager and such. And then he continued to work and grow. And he eventually established himself as a writer, director, producer in Hollywood and working all over. Among his highlights in his career, he created the first digital pre-visualization system for the feature film Clear and Present Danger, the original Jack Ryan film that starred Harrison Ford. And all that experience eventually brought him to, yes, China, where he's been involved in many projects, big and small. I am cross-posting this on Big Fish in the Middle Kingdom because, yet again, accidentally, my L.A.-based guest has a big China connection, but that we'll get into that in this show. But of all the references that I just kind of name-checked, the one that really cemented Steve's name in the back of my mind way, way, way back in the day was that he wrote what has become an absolute standard reference cinema book called Film Directing Shot by Shot. Now, it was published by the then-upstart Michael Weesey Productions, and I've been fortunate to meet Michael before. And this book was released in 1992, back when I was in film school, and it instantly became required reading in all my film production courses. We Xeroxed it. I told him we probably owe him some royalties technically, but we went on to have it be required reading. So we bought a lot of copies and I've given it to a lot of people who've asked me for recommendations, you know, like young filmmakers or students or people who are whose kids are curious. So it has this familiar blue cover and that was updated a few years ago to announce their new 25th anniversary edition. And that was freshly and thoroughly revised for the digital age. So it was a real treat for me to get to hear Steve's stories about putting that together in depth. Now, among the other crazy but true tales that I've already mentioned, We scratched the surface on Steve's several engagements as the personal filmmaking tutor for Michael Jackson. Yes, that Michael Jackson. And as he explained, this is a story he has never told before. Steve was resident at the Neverland Ranch for months at a time. I believe five months was the first engagement. And he was flown into luxury hotels to work with Michael. Sometimes they would just sit up late at night watching movies in in Michael's suite And he also saw some things in his time around Michael that will merit another show entirely someday. And I'm not trying to be too salacious. When we get to that portion of the interview, uh, Steve has, you know, mixed feelings about what he witnessed. But we will have a lot more about that topic another day. We're thinking of doing a special show, really just digging into that. 
Now these days, Steve and I overlap a bit because he has a strong interest in this intersection between art and neuroscience, which he has studied a lot more than I have. I have a real passing curiosity with this, and actually my friend Chris Chu, this was part of her focus at university. It's, it's part of her strange degree program that she put together. So among many other wonky and highly specific topics, Steve and I managed to connect on this. To top it all off, he's also a good friend with one of my very best friends, Kevin Geiger. So the small world meter is off the charts with this show for me. So more on all that later. For now, though, you can visit the blog post at crazyinagoodway.com for the links, contact information. And now I hope you enjoy this truly epic conversation with Stephen Katz. Stephen Katz, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to have you Although here. Although I'm not actually there. <laughs> <laughs> right. You are. Well, where are you? Are you Los Angeles specifically right now? I'm in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. so I'm, what, uh, uh, 15,000, 12,000 miles away? <laughs> you know, I, I was a liberal arts major. I think it's about... Uh, <laughs> My memory for the, I think it's about 6,800 uh, kilometers. So yeah, it's about 5,000 miles. It's a long way. I, I'm not, I'm not great with the maths, but I do know that it's about a 12 or 13 hour round trip. Uh, excuse yeah. me, one way. It's about, it's about 12, 13 hours, depending on which, which yeah. direction from LA to Beijing. Of course, I'm from LA. Now we're going to get into so many things and we've been having fun chatting before we actually are doing the show. And yeah. I sort of realized, oh, we actually need to get into the show because I'm getting so much interesting context from you. How do you introduce yourself to people who you would like to know better? Well, uh, it, well let me ask that, that uh, a question about that. Are you talking about how do I make cold calls to meet people or just, just people I, I would meet ordinarily as, as a way of finding out you know, how I to describe I just mean myself? if you're, if you're if people you would like to know, not, not in a pitchy way, in a, in a, in a and you know a, a fellow peer, but maybe they are, you know, yeah, not 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 in a job seeking way or something, but right, right. Well, that is, I'm a hyphenate, you know, I'm a, a writer, director, producer, or a director, writer, producer, depending on on uh, what I'm doing at the time. But yeah, I I, uh, I think of myself as a filmmaker, uh, you know, and people know me from different things. Uh, so there's the book, and I write for some magazines. Uh, but then some people know me as a production guy. So, uh, but I would like to be known essentially, uh, you know, writer, director, producer kind of covers it because I do most of those things um, during the course of a year. All of them get quite a bit of my attention and my time. Fantastic. And it's funny because I know you, I know your, I know you through your work for going to age us both here uh, since the early 90s. And we're going to, we're going to get to that in a moment because I have this question related to your first, you know, like really super visible success. And, and this may be the one that you mentioned, but let's, let's, let's start a little earlier. Where do you consider your roots? Where are you from? And what was sort of your, your, your early days like? Cause I want to see how that helped set you on this path that you're, that you got on. Well, um, uh, I grew up in Westport, Connecticut, which is a very, very arty community. And uh, it's in Connecticut. It's near New York City. uh, And it's the home to a lot of uh, theatrical and motion picture people and illustrators and writers. So um, I don't know if you know the town at all. It's pretty famous. But uh, didn't Paul Newman and uh, Joanne Woodward live? there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you know. Okay, so that's it. So all those guys. So I grew up in a town where there was. Certainly, let's say I'd grown up in in Texas, I'd probably be thinking football all day long. But at my high school and junior high, the arts were a big thing. And the the families that lived there were uh, many of them were advertising in New York City, very much like Don Draper in in, in Mad Men. Okay, Uh, Westport was absolutely one of those communities. It was Mm -hmm. was a bedroom community feeding um, uh, New York City. And many, many of the people were in communication. So that was around me. And my mom and dad... um, uh, both had an interest in the arts. My mom was a, an excellent illustrator, but she gave up and went into regular business and had her own company when I was still quite young. And my dad had sort of already given up his photographic interest. But, there, you know, down in the basement, there were, uh, you know, there were processing trays and um, all the gear he had sort of stopped using. But I was aware of it. So um, uh, I grew up in an area where there was a lot of encouragement for all the arts. And uh, that was, I would say, really started me in the directions. And I was, you know, grew up in the 60s, the 50s and the 60s. So 
you know, certainly know what that means artistically. And when I, I, you know, I guess what I remember was modernism. You know, that mm-hmm. was, so it was Coffee and Strauss and, and music and Hemingway and uh, uh, Fitzgerald and Joyce. It was, you know, all, all those things are what were sort of the uh, pantheon of, of artists. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then when, but uh, in terms of my motion picture interest, um, my mom and dad were away a lot. So my sister and I watched way too many uh, movies on TV. Okay. And that and my mom loved the movies. So that was part of a family thing. And, uh, uh, you know, I watched uh, the golden age uh, Hollywood films over and over and mm-hmm. over again. Okay. And then by the time I was, uh, I don't know, seven or eight, uh, I was given, you know, my first camera. And, um, you know, and even at the age of seven or eight or nine, just because my parents were in the arts and we didn't have huge conversations, but, mm-hmm. uh, you know, they certainly, uh, it was thought of that. I wasn't just taking snapshots. Right. And that I was, you know, framing and that thing was important. I didn't get a lot of instruction, but I, even at, at that early age, I was kind of aware that you had to pay attention to those things. And then I got a hold of my dad's eight millimeter movie camera when I was nine and uh, that plus a, a one event that happened uh, when I was in California briefly um, led me down the path of wanting to do stop motion animation like Ray Harryhausen. Oh, and that's true. Yeah, Always great reference. I, I have film. a lot of old school horror friends who are, whose ears are tingling yeah. right now. <laughs> my, that story, by the way, uh, there's thousands of kids of my generation and Spielberg, Lucas, all those guys who sort of had the same mm-hmm. passion. And, um, and I, you know, I, I mean, I'll just tell you what happened. I was, uh, yeah. I, li- I grew up in Connecticut, but uh, for one year, the family was moved out on business out to San Francisco. Okay. And I went to a smoke store. Uh, a smoke shop, you know, there, which was like the drugstore with the, uh, you know, they, they had a, a stools and a, and a, a, a bar where you could go get ice cream sundaes and things. And then they had the magazine rack. So I went over the magazine rack at one time and I saw my first copy of a thing called uh, famous monsters of film land and being All a right. red blooded American kid. Yeah. I was into horror films and that of, of the day, not sure. like a horror film sure. today. Yeah. Um, and science fiction. And, uh, uh, you know, I was leafing through it and it was the first time I saw pictures behind the scenes and they okay. had the stop motion, uh, Willis O'Brien stop motion armature for King Kong. And then they had these incredible, uh, drawings, mm-hmm. concept art and storyboards. And uh-huh. I was like, just a light went off and it suddenly combined all the things I was interested in. So you could see, you could see how they made the donuts a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, and so I was just like mesmerized. Oh my God, this is how it works. And that, and at that point, that was kind of it. I was going down that path. Now, you know, as I had other interests as a kid, mini bikes, go karts, sure. some sports, that sort of thing. But the uh, the deepest passion I had was for uh, motion pictures, and uh, so that's what I uh, started to do as a hobby in the basement. Uh, and back then, there were very few film books, right. but I started to read those, and I came from a family where there was a lot of interest in. A lot of respect and interest for books. So that was something you got on birthdays and Christmases and other times. And so it would, basically I would call it uh, uh, a kid lit. So yeah. it was things like the collected works of, of, of uh, Mark Twain and mm-hmm. uh, Rudyard Kipling and Jules Verne, H.G. Wells. But it, it was uh, and I just liked reading. So mm-hmm. I was already by the time I was 10 or 11, 12, very interested in literature and as I say, in the town where I came from, uh, this was common among my friends. Uh, so I could talk about, you know, a parody of, of Lord of the Rings, or Board of the Rings by <laughs> Kenny Beard and the guys out of Harvard uh, nice. Lampoon. And so that was so we would share that stuff. And even, you know, we, yeah, we like football and the other things, too. But it was a, it was a definitely a different em- emphasis where I came from. Mm-hmm. And then all through junior high, I was uh, the kid with the camera. Or I was and I could draw. So I was, you know, there's always three or four kids in your high school class who gets tapped to do the yearbook and other things. And so Mm -hmm. I was, I did that. So, and that all led to uh, going into high school and having, and Staples High School in Westport had the best theater department in the United States, bar none. It was, it was, uh, uh, it was almost like a professional theater. And we had the Westport Country Playhouse and I went there in the summer. So I can remember it at uh, 16, sitting in the uh, play us during the summer, um, during rehearsals. And I would go there and I would look, li- and I, I, I could hear Woody Allen direct. I could hear, what? uh, Oh wow. yeah. They, well, yeah, sure. It was just this dark 
theater without enough air conditioning. And um, you would and they'd be rehearsing whatever was uh, the play that was featured that week. Huh. And, uh, you know, and I sat there and listened to, you know, Josh Logan, no one remembers him, but uh, there are many, many, many uh, mm-hmm. directors came through. Many of them were actors who were directors and they were professional cast. You know, they were uh, people you saw on TV and from the mm-hmm. motion pictures in, in their later years. And um, so I, I had this enormous exposure to the arts and entertainment and performing arts uh, pretty much for as long as I could remember. So um, I'll yeah. shut up here. Well, <laughs> no, this is great. I, 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 I like have so many one, questions. One. But uh, so so that that's especially that had to be especially formative because you saw so you saw real professionals at a young age and you also saw them as people, whether or not you approach them per se, but you saw them as people who were right there in a room. You got used to being around people who were working at a professional caliber at a pretty young age. So you weren't among a bunch of people who didn't know what they were doing. You were actually modeling and, and being, uh, being mentored by osmosis by people who were really the best at what they do. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, when I sat there, I wasn't like, Oh, this is theater. I mean, I was already kind of reading theater and there, you know, with other people who talked about it and, you know, I was there at the playhouse. So, I, you know, when I was sitting there watching the rehearsals, I could come out and talk to people. I didn't interact with the, um, the actors or the directors very much at all. That was kind of like sort of prohibited, but I was in right. there and it would be almost an empty theater, uh, for the three days of rehearsal they would have. And, um, it would be a, it would be dark and a little bit hot, and I would just sit there for half an hour, forty five minutes, and that's I heard how a director spoke to an actor to guide a performance. And mm-hmm. at the same time, I had a my dad's cousin Milton Olson was really the top uh, visual effects projectionist in New York City, mm-hmm. and uh, what that meant was he <laughs> in the is how far back it is. Uh, this was in the days of process photography. Let's say like rear projection, things like that. Oh, yeah. Process. And so I was that he owned the gear and I was there and I was taught to do it. And I was on set at the age of 10 oh, watching okay. uh, Car 54, Where Are You? No kidding. Wow. And then a few years later, I spent a summer on what well, was actually wasn't the summer, but I, I was going on weekends and, uh, and, and sometimes during the week for a show called Hawk. Okay. Which Don't Burt Reynolds before he became famous. And he was a uh, right. Indian – uh, South Southwestern Indian in New York City as a detective. Oh, that was the character he played. Yeah, and uh, I think it only ran a season or two. And again, uh, it was I think Pontiac was the <laughs> sponsor because he was always driving a brand new Pontiac, which I continually polished for every shot. <laughs> right. And, uh, so he's yeah, it's like there's a guy in the trunk who gets out to polish the car. Yeah, and of course it was a union set, so it was limited what I could do. But they, sure. they would stick it. They had a two by four sort of bolted to the frame, and I could push up and down in that when he was driving. They let me do that in oh, a shot. Oh, nice! So, so, so for people who don't, who aren't aren't in our racket or or aren't as old as us in our racket, who don't even know how this works, without getting too nerdy about it. But basically, you're on a stage, and there's a screen where you know where like outside the the window that's behind the the, the shot. And yep. so that's you're literally the, the, the scenery going by is projected onto that. And then like you would be like you would be moving the car to simulate the motion of the driving. Yeah. 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 And so that's that's how the, the rear projection. And it was, it was absolutely worked. absurdly unconvincing. No, <laughs> oh, no, it's it's, it's hilarious when you see it now. But it's you know, it's it's what we had. And yeah. and when you watch, you know, back in the day, you just you just you accepted this as part of the vernacular of of film and TV. And we just kind of graded on that curve. It's like right now, I mean, we know that the superheroes aren't flying around, but yet those movies are hugely popular. People just go with it. You know, it's like they buy, you know, buy the premise, you buy the bit. So people, people people go with it. But I was that generation of kids like Spielberg and Lucas who are watching this stuff and going, Oh my God, this is terrible. (laughs) At the same time, we would compare it to the, the covers of science fiction art. Mm-hmm. Um, so even though I wasn't usually into science fiction by any means, I, you know, that stuff was around and you could see, oh my God, yeah, Frazetta and many, many, many others. And you'd look at these and say, why can't a movie look like that? Right. And then Spielberg and Lucas and others, uh, even, you know, even in the analog era, uh, made that work. I mean, first, the first really big breakthrough was 2001. Right. With Cooper. Yeah. And some amazing, of those same people amazing. then moved over to, uh, the George Lucas uh, team, um, for uh, for Star Wars, and that was yeah. really we never looked back after that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's I won't I won't tangent this too much, but um, uh, 
my old producing partner of 10 years, his uncle was actually the guy that essentially built what became the ranch as a producer in Hollywood and, and sort of shepherded Lucas, uh, through the trials and tribulations of Fox. And it's a long story. He, they had a huge yeah, argument yeah. and toward the end, he, he was the last guy of the, of the, of the old Hollywood guys that Lucas ran off. And, and the famous parting words were screw you and your stupid movie and you can keep your five points. <laughs> <laughs> and and this is yeah Jimmy Nelson he's in all the books if anybody wants to get super forensic wow. and um he he did just fine otherwise but that's he gave up five points on Star Wars is kind of an interesting kind <laughs> oh of an interesting God. footnote yeah so um in terms of you getting into film professionally, because we're, we're building yep. toward that, that, that blue book, of course, but, uh, which, you know, people who don't already know have, uh, are wondering what I'm talking about, but how did you actually get the, so, so going from your, your upbringing, how did you sort of decide to do film and TV stuff professionally? And what, what were sort of those, you know, formative professional years yeah. like? Well, uh, gee, I always, I, by the time I was 12 or 13, my parents and I, this, Steve's, you know, they never use the word filmmaker, but they said he's going to make movies. That's what he wants to do. Uh, we can't persuade him to become a doctor or a physicist or some other things, but this, you know, he's pretty much chosen his path even mm. at this young age. And um, then uh, when I went through high school and I was uh, around that time, uh, and I was very involved in, in theater lighting and theater and, and, and technical uh, backstage uh aspects of, of uh, performing arts. And I, the, you know, it was the sixties. So uh, we did a, the, we did a show um, called war and pieces, which was uh, won a lot of awards, but it had a little bit of a light show in it because that was what was going on. And uh, to, I'll make this short. I basically was to, on the, my 17th birthday. My friends took me to the film or East, which was the rock palace. Oh, yeah, of its sure, day. sure. And, um, that's so, really and cool. I'd already seen little I'm, I'm jealous. pieces of light show, and and uh, the, the Joshua light show was absolutely without question the best light show on either coast. There were the West Coast guys, there were the East Coast guys, but it, that was and everybody who really knew this stuff knew they were the most cinematic and the the, the, the really uh, flawless performances for hours at a clay were fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I went to this thing and the music was fine. <laughs> it was uh, Mott the Hoople. Oh wow! If I'm not if I, I remember yeah. right, it was Mott the Hoople. And uh, this new band that no one had heard of called Creed and Clearwater, <laughs> and uh, they were debuting. Okay, and uh, the headliner was uh, the Turtles. No <laughs> kidding! Wow. wow. And the Turtles were like almost a comedy act because Howie, which we, who would then leave and join Zappa, yeah, was like you know embarrassed by the whole thing, and and so it was all a bit like a send up. Right. Right. So, the, but right, anyway, yeah. Without having this drag on, I uh, so I was like, you know, the show is over, and I'm still looking at the screen because they left it up with like this uh, amorphous Lumia kind of thing going on, and I was just like, oh my god, how did they do that? And of course, I was already had five or six years doing process photography and background oh, right, right. stuff, and my cousin also didn't just do that; he also did a lot of. Uh, you know, the the big slideshow support with eighty carousels for corporate things, and I did okay. that too. So, so you really need um, all the technical I, I, stuff. Right. So I going into this, I was, you know, I just said, okay, how do they, how do they do it? <laughs> the next day I get on the train, uh, from, and I come back in, I go home, sleep. Next day I come in and I go down to the film Maurice and I'm pounding on the stage door <laughs> for about four minutes. And then someone says, why we're tired. We're closing up for the, we were, we ended at three. And I said, well, I, you know, I want to meet the guy who does a light show. He said, that's Josh White. If you run to the front of the theater, you'll catch him. And I did. And as a 17-year-old uh, who looked 11, I uh, <laughs> just started saying, you know, oh, my God, it was fantastic. And I have some background in this and I'll do anything to learn. Uh, and he said, well, uh, I said, I drove in. I, I came in this morning and he said, well, he said, where'd you come in from? And I said, Westport. And he does a little jump. And he said, well, my dad used to live in Westport huh. and I've got his old Volvo. Um do you know where Larry Torino's Volvo <laughs> dealership is? I said, yeah, it's across the bowling alley. He said, if you take my car and take it out to there for me and drop it off and pick it up in a week when it's finished and drive it back to New York, I'll teach you light shows. Oh, cool. And he kept his word. Huh. And then I was backstage many, 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 many times and, you know, starting to learn all the gear and where do you buy it and how do you make it and. Uh, Bill Schwartzbach there in particular took me under his wings. He was the he was the guy who mainly did the liquids, but 
And they were all out of the Columbia. Uh, they were all out of uh, Columbia Theater School. OK. They're all very smart guys. So anyway, that was so then I did that. And that was my first professional gig as I got mm. my own life show together. They helped me. And I started doing shows for like the Grateful Dead, Vanilla oh. Fudge, oh, wow. The Doors, Fly on the Family Stone. What? That's amazing. <laughs> and I was like 19. Oh, man, that's so cool. I had no I idea. I had to go through this stuff. <laughs> I, you know, when I had to go sign contracts, I couldn't sign them because I wasn't 21. Oh, oh did you have to be 21 at the time? Yeah, you couldn't sign okay. a contract. Nothing. So um, anyway, I uh, so I did that, uh, and it was a little bit of a side trip from motion pictures, uh, which I was still kind of, you know, I was still going on set with my cousin, and uh, but that was uh, with, with light shows. Um, uh, if you were young, it wasn't a problem. There were no unions. Mm -hmm. So I was able to do that. And it was a very short period of time, but, um, that went on for maybe, I don't know, like, uh, two, two and a half years into my early twenties. Um, and then I, in my hometown, I ran a series of professional concerts. I talked to them and as well, I worked at the Fillmore. Yeah. No kidding. And this would only happen in the sixties. So I did uh, kind of was like the birds with Delaney and Bonnie and Eric Clapton oh, and, uh, country Joe McDonald's. And the birds, and I uh, did, and then I also ran a move, uh, a film, actually two film festivals in town, um, and you know we rented a real, you know, motion picture pro projector. I didn't do like the sixteen millimeter Kodak pageant projector from the library in the middle of the mm. auditorium. I actually went out and did it for real. Yeah, built a curved screen for two thousand and one. And uh, then I got into bluegrass, and I was doing bluegrass, and uh, but I was occasionally doing film. For example. John McTiernan, who was the uh, director of Die Hard sure. and Predator and Red October, he married uh, uh, a friend of mine from high school. Okay. And when I was 22, uh, he did his first film uh, called The Demon's Daughter, although it was released as The Tales of the 21st Century, and they all <laughs> moved into the rabbi's house. All right. That, the rabbi was away for the summer. He gave that to them. And um, I became like their sound guy with an old Nagra. Mm -hmm. uh, I became their production um, designer for, for some of the sets. No okay. kidding. And they had no money, of course. Sure. And so that was John's first picture. Huh. Wow. <laughs> um, so uh, and then I did the music carried me until I was like 26 and uh, 27. And then I said, OK, that, you know, this I'm not going to have a living doing bluegrass banjo. Yeah, so I yeah get it's limited. Filmmaking. Unless you're the best guy in the world or the second best guy in the world, there's probably a, it's probably tough to really have that be your career. Absolutely, absolutely. It was just not, and I missed it. But I also thought, you know, uh, well, anyway, that was just yeah, yeah. a career that wasn't going to happen. But but your so, music really, and I won't derail on me. But this is actually, I mean, I professional musician was my primary focus through my twenties. And I yeah. had my encouragements and, and notable things along the way. Uh, not quite as some of yours are, are really amazing, but um, but yeah. So so I, I I can relate to this, and and you know was always also interested in film. And at a certain sure. point, you know, I realized for me that filmmaking was the kind of storytelling that I felt I was here to do, and it's also something I could right. do forever. I mean, as long as you're sentient, you can you can make films, you know. So, so how did you transition into, into the skills that led you to write the book that, that initially, you know, basically made you famous? Well, the, um, the thing, uh, when I was a kid, uh, you know, I was a little bit academic and I, uh, looked to books to find things out. And I, um, I was probably 10 and I had a Craig viewer. If you remember, there was an eight millimeter, yeah. mm -hmm. like a, it was like a movie scope. Right. And, uh, I used to get these, uh, well, I think in some way uh, I had a general understanding or interest in uh, the technique of film and the way you could produce psychological effects and, and the whole sort of neuroscience of that. I didn't know that word at the time, but that kind of thing was kind of interesting to me. And so I started to disassemble movies. OK. And uh, and I was, you know, I wasn't even a real just barely a teenager. And I got these films at the local uh, Barker's, which was the equivalent of like a Walmart then. And in the photo department, they had this, this rotating rack of castle films. There was okay. also Black Hawk. There were a bunch of them. You could buy these. There were four minutes. It'd be like Tarantula with Leo G. Carroll or, you know, <laughs> or it'd be a West. It, tons of stuff was there. And um, uh, I would take them and I would slow them down. I said, oh, OK, here's how these shots go together. And uh, I did that, you know, for a fair amount of time. 
uh, and I had a knack for it. I mean, I think I took what where I had an aptitude, and then at a very early age, because there was no real formal training of this kind going on, uh, I just started to figure it out myself. Mm-hmm. And um, and that was something sort of uh, throughout my you know I was I was editing films in my teens and you know and I just had a Bolex and I graduated from eight to eight millimeter to sixteen millimeter and of course then when I was working with my cousin you know I was around serious gear so I kind of knew even by the time I was fourteen or fifteen I probably knew seventy five percent of what you get in film school because mm-hmm. so I've been doing it. Sure. So anyway, so now I'm playing music. I'm in my 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 twenties, and uh, I just decide, well, I've got to get back to this thing. I've been doing it so so long. Um, uh, you know, I have all this grounding in it, and I don't have the same grounding in music. I learned to play bluegrass, but uh, you know, a year or two into it, with a teacher or two, uh, I learned okay, I have to learn chords, and you know, you have to learn like sort of the underlying system and and music theory. And I did some of that, but I realized, you know. These kids who start playing at the age of six, seven, eight, or nine, and by the time they're ten or twelve, you know they're already highly accomplished. Right. And I, I didn't do that. <laughs> also, music is a language, and you really do learn it faster when you're young. This is so true. starting yeah. at twenty was just not. I, so I then, feel really lucky to have started guitar like at you know eight or nine or whatever it was. Oh it's man, made all the difference. I'm, Oh, I'm so jealous because, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. It, 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 I don't know how anybody does it starting much later. But anyway, so now I'm 26 or 27, and I had a friend who was at the University of Connecticut. So I um, went out and stayed with him and then found I could I could uh, get a place to live in the grad dorms um, with him and uh, took some courses. Uh, and then I uh, – and, and basically what happened was I uh, – there was a uh, – there was a – screenwriting course with a guy who was the David Haversom, I think it is, who was the um, producer of uh, 310 to Yuma, the okay. original version. All right. Yeah. 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 They remade it a while back with Christian Bale. But yeah, that, that was a remake. Yeah, it was a remake. So there, and he did that and a bunch of other things. And he was a Hollywood guy who, would, you know, Holly gave up on Hollywood in his mid 60s and came yeah. to Connecticut with his wife, who was also a screenwriter. And they had had real careers out there. Sure. So uh, I wrote a script and um, I brought it to him and he said to me, why should I read this? You didn't take my class. Hmm. And hmm. he said, ah, I leave it on the desk. I'll get to it when I get to it. And like like a, a weekend later, he calls me up. He said, cats, I want to have lunch with you. Huh. So I had lunch and he said, you know, he said, I, this is the first script I've had hand me from a student and he said in four years that I thought really was even semi producible. <laughs> he said, you're okay. talented. I'll help you out a little bit. Nice. So he did help me out, introduced me to some people, and uh, then I came, uh, I, I left and decided that's what I was going to do. So then I was writing for uh, a couple of years, and I was getting uh, gigs, um, you know, as a production manager and, and commercials and, and even PA work, whatever mm-hmm. I could get. Mm-hmm. Uh, picked up some editing work, um, and, uh, you know, I worked at RNS Films briefly doing uh, sound editing, so I was on a flatbed. Um, and then I decided, uh, and Saturday Night Live was on at the time, and mm-hmm. uh, it was the hottest thing out there. So I said, you know, I, I'm going to make a short for them. And everybody counseled me, don't even think about it. They said, Albert Brooks can get shorts on, you can't. Uh, you know, everybody is offering them free film, every commercial director right. in New York City. Right. So I said, screw it, I'm doing it anyway. And so I did a parody of Brian De Palma who at the time was, you know, one of the top directors in the mm-hmm. world, but clearly ripping off Hitchcock and exactly. what he called an homage, but not all of us felt that's what it was. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, he lifted his technique, sure, the sure. POV tech, sure. in ways that were kind of, wow, well, that's a little bit close. A little uh, on the nose, yeah. So, yeah, but he, he got, Brian's a good guy and he's a good director. And so, anyway, but he was really a big deal at the time. And so I made this thing. And uh, uh, really ran out of money. It took quite a while. Uh, and it was like a trailer. And it showed essentially the scene in The Birds where everybody's running down the street. Okay. And uh, – but it was, instead of doing birds, we used clams. <laughs> and it was called The Clams. <laughs> I – okay. This sounds – I think I've seen this. So, oh, yeah, it, was, it, was, it became famous. So what happened was <laughs> I had this enormous – I had a bunch of uh, short pieces and then the, the thing. And instead of taking like a 400-foot film can in, which would have been big enough, I took like a 2,000-foot can. It was, it was like, you know, like a pizza yeah. size, large pizza <laughs> size. And I go to NBC 
And I get in the line and, you know, there's the guard and one by one people having to show why they should be allowed to go into the building. And I had nothing. And he looks at me with the cannon to my arm and he says, uh, you're in the long line. If you're making deliveries, you need to go to that elevator over oh. there. He said, you're delivering something, right? And I go, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm <laughs> delivering something. So lucky break is this elevator took me to the floor. He told me the floor. I go up there. I go in. And there is there are two floors for SNL, one of which is a regular reception desk. where the, And then there's the production floor. And I got in the production floor, and there's nobody. Wow. And I'm, sun, and I'm wandering around. And finally, after about five minutes, uh, the producer uh, is coming towards me. Um, uh, uh, Lauren Michaels? Uh, uh, Bob Tischler. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, no, it wasn't Lauren. It was Bob T- T- Tischler. And uh, because Lauren took a year off to go to Hollywood. That's which right. Which he regretted. That's right. This guy's coming at me. And, uh, you know, I babble this ridiculous kind of introduction. And, you know, it's, this is unsolicited. Please look at it. And he says, uh, uh, yeah, OK, let me look at it. They go into a room and they screened it. And I couldn't even go in the room because, you know, I was worried they wouldn't laugh. Right. And uh, they're laughing. And he comes out and he says, oh, yeah, we're going to buy it. Uh, <laughs> so I, Amazing. And then now this was in um, August and this is the show had not gone on. This is the, they're, they're weeks away from the first show. Mm-hmm. They ended up taking the short and putting it in the first two minutes of the opening season show. Wow. Because it was so strong. And then the next day in the New York Times, they said uh, a pretty good start to the with a new season and modified cast for SNL. But uh, with one real high point, which was the clams harkening back to the, the the best of SNL in their early season. So, oh my gosh, what yeah. a, what what what? That's amazing praise. What was who who were the? Can you remember who were the who were the new cast members? Like what what was sort of that that? Oh shift? my god, I, I mean, think Tim Kazarinski, I think, okay. I, and I'm not a hundred. I think yeah. uh, uh, who else was, was Kevin there? Nealon? Did he come on then, or was that? later i think think eddie murphy that may have been his first season but i'll have to check and then i and and then i was taken under the wing of remember mr mike he was uh a a michael o'donoghue he was one of the original yeah he was the legendary legendary writer at snl yeah really helped shape uh, the show as much as like almost any single person besides lorne michaels is what most people would say i think yeah, O'Donnie really was the senior guy there from the from the Harvard yeah. from the Lampoon. Yeah. Excuse me. And uh, you know, he took me under his wing, and uh, and then he got fired because he basically did a uh, the show wasn't doing that well that year uh, into the in, into the season, um, and he did a the longest piece they had done to date in the show, which was like a seven minute attack on Fred Silverman, the head of the network, <laughs> comparing him to Hitler in the bunker. <laughs> oh no. Wow. Yeah, no, it made front page all over. Yeah, the, the, the yeah I, day, remember the I remember that. I remember that. Yeah. and everything, right? Uh-huh. You know, and, and said so you got to have real balls to be uh, taking on, you know, your boss, your boss of the boss of bosses. Exactly. So he didn't, and, and then he left, and I wasn't there. But I had already done, pitched the second thing we were going to do, which was at the time the Shroud of Turin was on the front page of, mm-hmm. I think, in November, mm-hmm. the front page of Time or U.S. News yeah. and World Report, uh-huh. something like that, because the Vatican agreed to have a, a thread carbon tested. Right. And so I did a, so I wrote a parody for Christmas, which was going to be Polaroid Insta Shrouds. You don't <laughs> have to be Messiah to get big, beautiful prints in just 30 seconds. Awesome. It's, so it's like everybody's at the dining room table and uh, grandpa falls over dead. And then they come out with this like roll of saran wraps and, you know, they, they, they pull this sheet of, uh, of a Polaroid Insta shroud over him and then they get an image. So, wow. Uh, and fortunately it got censored bit. They like, it was like they cut one piece off at every week for like okay. five weeks. And then Michael was gone and then, and then that was over. So okay. that was my, that was my introduction, um, an exit from Saturday night live. And I probably could have continued there, but you know, in solidarity, I, you know, Michael's gone. So yeah. if he was your guy, if you use your channel. And I, and, yeah. So, and then, um, and that got me an agent and some other, you know, sure. and then I was in the industry and, uh, uh, I, uh, met a guy, John Goodyear, who was in my, from my hometown uh, or was living in my hometown at the time. And he was a very well-known music video producer. And, uh, he heard about me and we met and, uh, uh, so, I worked for him doing storyboards and some production art and kind of things really for a few months. And he finally, and, but he got to know me very well. 
and uh, we would talk about films. And I was pretty encyclopedic in those days. And he said, you know, man, you, you know much more. He said, you're more of a director than I am. So I'm going to back you. Huh. And then we, uh, and then we had a company for a bunch of years. And that took me through a hunk of the 80s. And we we're doing commercial production and uh, a couple of music shows. And uh, that was, uh, uh, you know, it was a good time. We were, mm. our, our goal was to try and make, uh, you know, our own indie features. I only had an interest in, fe- in features. But I did get to work with real professional crews and stuff doing commercials. So um, that went on for some time. And then uh, now we're getting into the, you know, let's just skip ahead to the late 80s. Yeah. I got married. Uh, I got an agent in California who said, you've got to stay here to be able to, for me to sell you. Right. You can't do this from the, you need to pop and into and a meeting wife. with short notice, things like that. Right. So it's all about pitching and it's, look, it's a relationship driven business. Right. So, right. but my wife didn't want to do that. And I came back and felt I could do an indie approach to, you know, uh, rather than doing the full on Hollywood approach, which was probably a major <laughs> mistake. <laughs> Looking back, you know, Michael, oh, okay, this is, this is a fork in a road here. It's a fork in the road, and I stepped on the fork, and uh, <laughs> you know, got, got to. So this. then I, uh, yeah. and then and then I was still in Connecticut, and um, uh, I, I hooked. A, and then my first partner uh, got married and moved out of the area, and uh, we dissolved the company. And I joined another company. This is the guy that did the twenty four track sound studio. Mm-hmm. Great guy, Cliff P. And we did that for a year and a half, for two years, and. Uh, now I'm 39. My my future stuff isn't going. My agent isn't real. I'm not out there, and I'm thinking, oh, that's not this is not good. Got separated from my wife. A lot of turmoil. And uh, during that time, uh, I met Michael Weesey. Uh, oh, actually, yeah. I met him before, mm-hmm. and uh, we became friends. And so one day at a diner in Westport, Connecticut, he said, "Oh, I'm doing a publishing company." I think mm-hmm. at the time he was the head of non theatrical programming at Vestron when Vestron mm-hmm. was a pretty big deal. Yeah, this was a top for people who wouldn't know. It was it was a Vestron was a top video company back right. when home video really ruled the like tape really ruled the earth. Right, and essentially what the deal was with uh, Austin first, who who I, I think that's his name started the company. He had been at Time Life or something, and they had a golden parachute for him, and he traded it for electronic rights back in like. 81, right? As VHS and beta is just happening. Oh, they didn't know what the hell that oh, meant. Shoot. And he had this enormous library. Wow. So this is kind of like Lucas making empire. the deal for merch on Star Wars before anybody knew what that could be. Exactly. Exactly. Not it's quite exactly as big, probably, but so probably significant. Know. Right. So then, so then anyway, uh, that, that's where I met Michael. And Michael had done his own little comedy short, so we had something in common. And I did some comedy stuff for him at Vestron. We did these little shorts the video baby the video dog the video boyfriend the video girlfriend and they were all these silly 10 minute things we did and now i had the uh, publishing company just starting it out and he said you know steve you know so much about filmmaking and the visual side and putting it together mm-hmm. i bet there's a book there and like a week later i handed in a, a, a toc uh, a, a table of contents right and he said yeah and then i wrote the book which i thought would take six months and, and a year and a half or two years later <laughs> I was still <laughs> working on it. But then it came out and um uh you know it was almost from the get go it was it, it was uh an event, right? You right. know, at least in in that in that kind of, that slice of publishing. And um uh then on the basis of that, uh I got a call from Michael one day. He said, We got this weird call, Steve. Uh someone purporting to represent Michael Jackson says Michael wants to meet you. Uh, he, you know, he, he wants to, he's wants to be a film director and we're checking it out. I come back a week later and said, yep, it's real. It really is him. He's going to call you on Thursday night. Wow. <laughs> so I get this call from Michael Jackson on oh. Thursday night. You know, he's like at the peak of his career. He's like 33 or 34 yeah. years old, and yeah. like 92 or something. And, uh, so, and he does, he makes the pitch. Yeah. Would you come out and stay at the ranch for an extended period of time? And then for several months, we couldn't get it together. He kept canceling and I was pretty much writing it off. And then mm-hmm. finally it was like, get out here next week. And I moved out and I lived at the ranch in 1993 in the summer, in the summer. And I was there for weeks and weeks and weeks. And one-on-one with no one else around, I would teach Michael <laughs> shot flow. <laughs> and, uh, you, you, you know, were and Michael Jackson's like, directing I'll, teacher. Let, let's, let's not blow past this. You were brought out to live at Neverland Ranch for the summer right. of 92, and you're Michael Jackson's private no, not, directing 93, teacher. 93. 93. Okay. Yep. Wow. <laughs> and I lived in this 
gorgeous bungalow. Uh, and uh, Michael would show up some days and sometimes not. And, and, and Michael had made the deal for Michael. The publisher had made the deal for me. And he basically asked for my commercial day rate, which is very hot. Sure, sure. And um, hey, but it's Michael Jackson. I'm living on a ranch where there's, you know, he's got a zoo and he has like his own movie theater. And there's, you know, an amphibian. There's, uh, you know, this uh, he had an amphibian zoo. Mm-hmm. which was, uh, you know, all these kids was a, a big building and anyway, had all that stuff. And I'm thinking, okay, he can afford this. So, uh, and I lived there, but some days he wouldn't show up and they would call me in the mornings. Oh, we're so sorry. Michael had to take the helicopter down to LA to record some tracks over, but he says he promises he'll be there tomorrow. So, um, and I just hung out there and it was, it was a little bit weird. I don't know how much you want to talk about this, but it was, it, you know, I could go on for quite a while about the experience of being at the ranch. Well, that's not, that sounds like something I'd love to do a show just about that, basically. But let me, let me, let's come back to that in a second. Uh, yeah. I want to say, I will have said this in the intro that I haven't recorded as I'm talking to you right now in real time. But the book we're talking about is film directing shot by shot. Yeah. Which, which was, as I said to you, you know, privately, it came out. I I was in film school at Georgia State University. Not a not a well known program, although a good a young program. And now it's very established and not something that's that's a name program, but it's you know has mm. really good instructors and program there. But uh, I remember that that Gary Moss, who was my beloved production instructor, came in one day when that book was first edition, you know, first printing, hot off the presses. And was, was basically saying, Hey guys, this is, check this out. This, this was just put out and all these things that he had been doing with handouts and his own like drawing on the board. All of a sudden you had taken the basic vernacular of filmmaking of shots and framing and how things cut and, you know, relating it to different genres and why you would do certain things. And it was really all in one and it was the most comprehensive practical book, hands-on book related to this at the time, extremely esoteric topic. And still there are tons of, you know, YouTube videos and things now where people talk about yeah. it half the time. They, you know, I mean, their, their training is, is mostly self-taught or something, but this, this was legit. This was something legit and it became the most passed around thing. And, you know, I, 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 we probably owe you some royalties from all the Xeroxing, but then everybody ended up buying their copies. <laughs> so I think it all worked out, you know, probably, probably balanced itself out like the next <laughs> semester because like everybody, it became a textbook. It became a required reading for the course for the next semester. So that book is one of the, I'm going to say that's probably, that's one of the top five books that I've gifted to people over the years. Wow. Yeah. Mark. So thanks for writing that book. It, it's it, my <laughs> copy is back in, in my storage in LA. My, my old <laughs> copy, my brand new copy of the 25th anniversary getting, we'll get to that in detail later, but you, you, you know, you did the big anniversary edition and my cinematographer, uh, Naeem Sarafi, he has that right now and he's going through it and enjoying it and is just blown away. He's like, this is because he had never seen the original somehow. He's like, wow, this has been around. I'm like, yeah, this is how I learned what I'm talking about <laughs> in, in a lot of ways. So uh, thank you for that book. And like you said, well, it thank became- Thank you for it, buying it. That's, that's 10 cents in my pocket, I think. Sweet. Well, I, 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 I've given you about a dollar twenty now, I guess, over the years. dollar <laughs> fifty maybe, possibly. But um, so that really, that really, you know, that was one of those big landmarks that really helped to to establish you in in a different area, so yes. in publishing and yeah. and so yeah, this Michael Jackson gig. I mean, I wouldn't do in, I wouldn't mind doing five more minutes on that if you have like a you know let's let's jump back to the narrative because that's pretty fascinating. So yeah. w- w- was there was he wanting to was he just wanting to learn it or was I mean he had an idea that he was going to direct his own videos. I mean he wanted to actually do it. Feature films. Okay. And well, there's, so I, I to finish wrap yeah, that up a little yeah. bit. So anyway, the, the summer that I was, they, well, yes, Michael wanted to be a film director. He had already directed a short, which only a handful of people have seen. It's in pan, it's, it's in pan, you know, it's Panavision. It's widescreen, ultra widescreen, okay. like cinema. Screen. Yeah. And uh, which which most student films are not. And exactly. it starred uh, Sophia Loren's son. Okay. And he had just done that like a year or two before I got out. And uh, he knew a great deal about film because, you know, Scorsese had uh, uh, directed one of his music videos and had many others, John Landis. And Mm -hmm, he asked mm -hmm. a lot of questions. So he knew the line. He knew the 180 degree line. Mm -hmm, And he knew mm -hmm. quite a bit. He knew something about lenses. But and um, uh, so that summer, unfortunately, 
uh, there were you know, there were kids coming and going, and uh, uh, one of them, uh, whose name was Jordy, was there the most at one period. And uh, we would make these little shorts, and so Jordy wasn't left out. We would, you know, he would sometimes handle the camera, sometimes he would, mm-hmm. it would be him and Michael. We do scenes, and um, he was the kid who first accused yeah. Michael. And so, at, yeah. yeah, at the end of the summer, Norma Stikos, who ran the Empire said, Michael really likes you. He feels very comfortable with you. You're very down to earth with him. You're not trying to get something all the time. And he appreciates that. And he wants you to come on tour with him and shoot a documentary wow. of the tour. You're going to be the documentarian for the tour. Are you interested in doing that? Uh, you'll be away for seven months. You'll lock your house up. He's, and, and, you know, and you'll travel in a way you probably never would ever travel again. You'll be on a private plane. Yeah. And so, uh, so I said, uh, well, of course. And then they, then, then, the, you know, my teaching gig was over, and now they were going to move into doing the tour, mm-hmm. and that uh, started. Oh, I don't know, in, in uh, end of August, maybe early September, and week by week they were postponing, and then it hit the press. Okay. And it all blew up, and then the tour was canceled, and so that was that. But. Uh, fast forward to 2002, they get in touch with me again. I go out again and, uh, I went, returned to the ranch and did a mini version of what we, but this time he had a movie he wanted to do, wanted me to produce. And I was mm-hmm. never fully, I, you know, well, when we do a, a specific thing about this separately, I have my views about what I thought at the time, yeah. you know, whether it was you know real or not. And I had enough doubt that he was guilty that I, you know, but I was I was uncomfortable with it. But I went back and I did this short thing and had these like, one strange. I remember he was he had to go down and do depositions in L.A. So when they flew me out, I didn't go to directly to the ranch. I went to the Beverly Wilshire and Michael had taken over an entire floor and his his suite was three thousand square feet. Wow. <laughs> and um, he would call. So I would be there and then I remember one night at midnight I get this call and he says, Steve, can you come on over? There's a lot of food. Let's watch movies. <laughs> so I go over and we go in his bedroom and he's got the screen up. He's got like a 70 inch screen and I'm, and I sit next to him and he's on the bed. I'm in a chair and we watch the Stephen Summers version of uh, the mummy and okay. Michael keeps stopping. How do they do that? Why did yeah. they do that? I like this. And uh, we went, we did for like an hour huh. and ate uh, Chinese leftover Chinese. Cause he'd had some business meeting mm. and there was all this food left. <laughs> So that was like, and I, and I just could, I, and I, I was sitting there thinking, this is too strange. So anyway, that was, <laughs> I have many other Michael stories, but wow. that was, yeah, the, we'll uh, have to, we'll have to, we'll have to circle back around to that and do a special, uh, episode. I had no idea about that, or I would have framed some of these questions, you know, would have worked that Well, you'll be the more. first. Oh, because you didn't hear talk about I've it. I've told these stories, but I've never told them, I, they're, they're definitely not unpublished, and I've sort of kept them oh. private all these okay. years. Okay. Well, I didn't really want to be uh, pulled into, but most recently when it was a lot of turmoil, I didn't want to end up on, you know, uh, entertainment tonight right. or whatever the hell it is you know, for, for 45 seconds. The guy was at the ranch. I got it. Well, let's definitely circle back to that <laughs> because I think there's a lot to, to, to get into there and, and it would be good for us to, for, for me to know what I'm going to ask you about before I stumble through the woods a bit. I, I know some people from the music world who worked with him on the music side and, and had yeah. nothing but great professional things to say about him in the studio. But that was the, that was the context in which they knew him. You know, they didn't, they didn't okay. know him from his home life and stuff. Yeah. Um, he was so, great with me. I, I, yeah. I have no complaints. He was extremely nice and a very sweet guy and uh, very smart. And also he spent, uh, I'll, I'll leave the sto- that part mm-hmm. of our stuff uh, yeah. with this is that, he was continually trying to impress me. I'm living in his one billion dollar empire, you know, yeah. which is 2,500 acres of which he owns the mountain. Okay. And uh, you know, just extravagance every place you look. There's a train. There's uh, just just a theater. There's mm-hmm. uh, there's the zoo. There's all these things, stable, all this stuff. And um, he's trying to impress me because he wasn't formally educated. Right. Right. And uh, so it was it was kind of strange. I'd be you know I, I'd look around me at this vast opulence and think and uh yet he uh he felt uh you know i guess uh, had a lot of you know, embarrassment yeah uh that um he was in the arts but uh, everybody else was better educated than he so well 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 i'll i'll 
let's let's wrap up this section. But I'll yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll I'll mention I actually mentioned my old it's it's his story to tell in any detail. I know it's secondhand, but I've heard it so many times with so many pieces. My old producing partner and best friend of ten years, his father was like actually a pretty legendary TV director and directed some movies. Um, mm. but old school director started as an AD, their family's in the business since the beginning. And yeah. he, they had this estate in Encino which, where they lived. And when the Jackson five, like moved there and became a thing, they sold, they had a whole big giant back part of the land. They sold that, that became the Jackson five. That's, that's where Joe Jackson bought that. And that was their big house uh-huh. in Encino where Michael grew up. And so my buddy, yeah. You know, uh, I'm 51 and so is, so is my old partner. So we were about five, six years younger than he would have been. But so he grew up as a little kid seeing Michael as a, as a young teenager, you know, like playing basketball, sometimes with brothers, yeah. but usually by himself. And so, I mean, he knew him, you know, as a kid and yeah. saw this, but you know, that's a whole story. And, and God knows I don't want to be throwing out random things. Uh, but, but the stories that, you know, everything that I heard, any insights, it, it cements what you, what everybody else has heard about growing up with Joe Jackson. So I can only imagine yeah. what that would do to a guy. So moving on back to yeah. the film business. So, so where did you go from there? Kind of for better or for worse. So the Michael, you know, well, and, so and, then, and there was so intervening I, time you know, as well, but yeah, where, where did you go from, from there? How did, and how did you well, get into so, China? We've got to talk about all of this. Okay. Okay. Sure. Well, anyway, so now it's 90, it's the early nineties. The book is out and I'm getting a lot of, you know, uh, press for that in, in, in the trades. Uh, and so, uh, and then I did the thing for Michael and, uh, then almost that same year, uh, a friend of mine, Ralph Singleton, who's a, who's a well-known producer was doing clear and present danger, mm-hmm. uh, for Bob Ramey and Mace Newfield. Mace Newfield yeah. Producer. Yeah. And so, uh, I'm I was times. teaching at the AFI. I was doing workshops about the book. Ralph knew I was over there. He said, Hey, you got to come by Paramount. And visit. So I did. And um, so I'm sitting down with Ralph. He said, ah, we got this terrible problem. You know, we had a uh, we had a a location for the for this for the big action sequence when they're trapped in a narrow street. Mm -hmm. uh, Harrison Ford and the other American CIA or whatever they are. And um, he said it was uh, we lost the location and it was originally an east west street. Uh, and therefore, as the sun goes over, it's always, there's no shadows. Oh, okay, right. It's parallel, it's kind of going yeah. the same yeah. direction. Same, okay. same path as the sun. And now they get a new, now they get a new location, and, and this and, time, and it's, it's crossed. It's, uh, right. It's north, south, and so I said, hey, you know, I got software, I know, at this point I had, I was early into, uh, computer graphics for, for movies, and okay. this is really very early on, and, um, I said, gee, you know, Ralph, I can uh, I can take care of that for you. I can build uh, a simple a set of, uh, of shapes to be the street, and I can tell you, give me the loca- the longitude, latitude, or the name of the city and where it is, and uh, the time of day you're going to shoot, and I can give you 12 images of where the shadows are going to be. He said, oh, that's fantastic. And then that conversation went into what else I could do, which really what I was describing was digital previs, although what, there was no previs. There was no digital previs. Right. And... Uh, so then he takes me into this, on the set and Harrison's there and uh, Philip Noyce, the director, is mm-hmm. there. And uh, he waits for Philip to leave because this is significant. Philip leaves and he pulls me aside with uh, with uh, uh, Mace Newfield and says, you know, Steve's got this thing he says he can do to kind of, you know, we've got storyboards. But Steve can do this other thing, which is more like a you know Saturday morning cartoon. to And, and because, you know, we'll keep. Philip sort of under control. He's been shooting, you know, they were a little, they were over budget and shooting too okay. much. And, yeah. and Philip's a, Philip's a very professional guy. So he wasn't out of control, but he liked to shoot a lot and they were over budget. So anyway, they said yes. And then I returned and then I did the first digital previs for a movie. Wow. And, um, uh, on and, clear and know, present uh, danger, uh, uh, clear and present danger. And I get the thing done and I bring it back. And I have to say, even by today's standards, it was pretty impressive. And so, you know, it had sound, it had music, okay. it had yeah, you know, sound effects. And we had, um, you know, we didn't have Harrison, but we got pictures of Harrison and animated them. So mm-hmm. you couldn't tell he blinked. And, and we did the whole, it was a whole, we did the whole sequence wow. in 3D. Uh, what? And I got you did it in 3D? Huh? This is all in 3D. Jeez. 
And, and when this when 3D was so new that yeah. practically very few people my jaw really my jaw is on the floor for the audience. I mean, film people understand how how kind of bananas that is. But you you basically did you see did you see this as like a real shot to kind of blow people's minds or like to push the boundaries of of what was possible? I, did. I mean, it's like sure, I'm, I'm going to do this the best I can possibly do it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. The money didn't yeah. even matter. I didn't pay attention sure. to the money. I was just, you know, sure. we're doing this thing. And you I'm got this shot. Gonna lay the gonna, I'm not going to blow it. Well, I mean, even in, in the original shot by shot that you had, there is mention of software, you know. Right. And uh, uh, so I was already and, and no one had done it. So I said, I'm going to do it. And uh, so I did. And uh, it became a uh, it was like a big hit. It was on Entertainment Tonight. And they ran my stuff on the top and then the actual movie on the bottom to compare to show how close they were. Yeah, yeah. And then it was in it was in tons of other books. The guy who was the senior tech engineer at uh, senior scientist at Avid wrote a book on digital production and he did three pages. And there was a European magazine that did like 10 pages. But then it was in all over the place for like a year or so. Mm-hmm. It was it got me a lot of uh, uh, press and credibility. And I so I had the book, Michael Jackson. I had the clear and present danger. And um I was about to go uh, try and get a feature going in, in California, and uh, it, it looked like it was going to be a long haul, and I felt I needed a gig. So I came back to New York City, and I was introduced to the folks over at Curious Pictures, and Curious Pictures was the biggest animation studio in New York City. They did Pee Wee's Pay House, and they also had uh, a camera department with uh, Mitch, oh, two Mitchell Rackovers. We had uh, two motion control rigs that were a ton of piece. We had green screen stage. We had multiple stages. We had a Oxbury down shooter. We had uh, uh, a props and set department. It was impressive, wow. and uh, they were doing mixed media. That was their thing, and they the only thing they weren't doing was digital. And they said, "Hey, we heard about you. Can you come in here and, and talk to us?" So I did, and I brought a uh, illustrator's annual, and I said, "You know, because I'd already heard they they already allowed me uh, they allowed me to know that they weren't going to." build what Hollywood was building was, you know, a, a two or $3 million department overnight. Sure. And so I said, you don't have to do that. I said, because basically computer graphics are based on a model, a tech model, which is essentially uh, is photorealism. Mm-hmm. Um, I said, but you don't have to do that. And I said, here's an illustrator annual. And I just went from page to page showing, and I said, you could do these styles and you sort of do an end run. This stuff is beautiful. We can put it in motion in the computer. But you don't have all the overhead of photorealism, which is, right. you know, expensive. Yeah. So they jumped on that. And then I built that department. And it was pretty uh, – certainly it was uh, – we were way ahead of the curve for a year or two in New York City because we replaced their post-production with After Effects and, and new, to all tools that were brand new. Yeah. And it was incredibly difficult to do. But I did that for a bunch of years. And, um, you know, and, and it was interesting. I, we, you know, we, they had TV shows. They had commercials. Primarily commercials. And then while I was there, I did for uh, Robert Wilson and Philip Glass. They were doing a 3D stereoscopic opera. And okay. I got to be the creative director on that for a bit. They brought it to us because they never had any money. I remember I remember and, write-ups uh, about this. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So I, anyway, so I put time into that and did that. So it was an interesting period of my life. And uh, uh, then uh, I uh, – Wanted to, I, I felt I wasn't being tr- treated properly. Mm. Uh, they weren't really promoting me as a director as much as I wanted to be. And they felt it was a conflict of interest if I'm running the department, even though I was a creative director mm. and I was doing both. So um, I ended up leaving with two other guys there, their senior their, their senior producer and one of the, and their top animator. And we left because we all had the same complaints. And I and I liked the people at Curious. And, you know, it's just that, you know, they were partners and just didn't want to give anything up. So we said, well, okay, when we start our own shop, and we did that for a few years. Then I get to the uh, early 2000s, and we were hit by – we did very well. And Barry Diller tried to buy our company, but um, the NASDAQ crashed, and we were heavily invested in a thing called Pitch TV, which I concocted, which was going to be the first online entertainment thing. But, the, but there wasn't enough broadband out there to really to support it, so we were really way ahead of the curve, too far ahead of the curve. And uh, so then when the NASDAQ tanked, uh, the various investment deals we had looked for went away. Mm-hmm. And we said, oh, God, well, let's get back to our commercial production and we'll build up the money again, our war chest and get back to features. And then 9-11 hit. Oh, OK. Yeah. And that just that really was the end. 
we had we had spent a lot of money doing this and gambled on this thing and uh uh, we had a lot of con- we had we had clients that were out of the Midwest and they just weren't coming to New York and right. I and I don't really blame them it was it was a terrible place to be for six months to a year but that killed us and so the, the I left and uh, I said you know guys I've got to do features I can't build this up for another two or three years yeah you know and I wasn't a kid anymore I went and I said this, this is it I got to do features this is what I bet, bet my life on. Mm-hmm. So I uh, turned around and started to do that and was getting little gigs here and there and uh, some big gigs and j- just by myself. And I, I should also mention that starting in 1992, I, used to, I was a senior contributing editor at Millimeter Magazine, which in its day was the top, mm-hmm. yeah, top production magazine. magazine. Yeah. So, that was, so that was going on all the time that I was at uh, Curious and, and at Michael Jackson's. All these things were concurrent in those first two or three years. And uh, so a decade later, I'm now, um, you know, still writing for the magazine. And uh, I uh, got a call from uh, Eric Watson, who was the producer for uh, Darren Aronofsky. Mm -hmm. And they had an animated film they wanted to do, but it was R-rated. And they'd gotten some Disney money uh, for development. Not a huge amount, but enough to do a script and some tests and all that. And uh, they had heard that I was a guy that, hey, he created Curious Pictures. It was was brand, it was, you know, or Curious Digital, which is a brand new Mm-hmm. kind of way of doing things and was a model for Nickelodeon and MTV and other people. And, uh, and they caught up very quickly, but you know, we did get some, I did get some credit for that. So uh, they said, uh, can you help us? Can you come on and produce? So I did that and I looked at what they had and we all kind of agreed. The script was kind of had a flaw, it's flaw at its core mm-hmm. in the story. And I, so I didn't think it was going to go, but I, but they were paying me and they had the Disney money. So then I said, you know, you can't do this for 30, 40, 50, 60, 80 million. Uh, and so we talked about what the budget should be. And then we agreed it had to be done out of out of the country. So I started to put the word out various places, including, well, I, I, Asia in general, uh, because I had, in fact, done a lot of 2D work at Curious and other places um, in, uh, you know, Korea and the Philippines. And they, they had been doing 2D uh, finishing for all the animated studios um, in the U.S. for for you know thirty years, right? You know you did all the key poses and sent every and the all the in betweens were done in Asia. So anyway, there was to make a long story short, a three D company heard that I wanted to uh, uh, that I was looking for a studio, and so this company GDC, which was doing their first feature, and they were the first big CGI studio in China, and they said, well, you got to come over and see our place. We'll fly you over. So they flew me over for like a week. And then they piggybacked that. They got me a teaching gig at uh, 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 Shanghai University, Mm -hmm. which became like a way bigger thing than I ever could have imagined. And uh, then I was um, I was there and they said, would you look at our movie? And what they were doing was uh, Jean Drew Mobius is one of the most famous graphic novel illustrated he's french right, right. and uh, a, a legendary guy he was in heavy metal in the early days sure, i known... remember him from exactly from that right so uh we were doing through the mobius strip they were doing through the mobius strip oh. and uh so i uh, looked at it and i said man you know they had major problems and so i uh, said well i wrote them up 14 pages of notes and they looked at it and they said would you come and fix it we got <laughs> yeah, exactly. to get the can to show some of us yeah so I uh, didn't want to do it. My wife didn't want me to do it. And so we came, we con- concocted a deal that was so expensive uh, and had a poison pill in it. We felt that they wouldn't do it. And the poison pills that I wouldn't report to the director. The director was a, uh, a Disney guy who was really a visual effects soup guy who had just moved into directing a co-directing like a, a direct the DVD thing for yeah. Disney. And um, so he was completely overwhelmed and it yeah. wasn't all his fault, yeah. but he, wasn't, he wasn't really from the story side specifically. Got it. And uh, he was very good at managing the teams as best he could. It was 300 people in this wow. immense studio. And like 100 of the people in the studio lived in the studio. And they ran it like a motel. It was all very slick. Hmm. So uh, anyway, so there it was. I was there. And um, they said yes to my terms. And I said, oh, my God. <laughs> no, you have to do this uh, thing. What am I going to do now? And so – but it was very good money. And so sure enough, I just sat there and I said – I'm going to, you know, hand me over everybody I need. Here's what's going to happen. And I just started storyboarding. Yeah. And I took all the stuff I felt didn't work and and thumbnailed it. And uh, and I did that. So uh, we rebuilt a lot of it, recut it, 
Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there's another editor that came in from a gal from the West um, whose name I can't remember. And she brought a real editor over. And that was a help. Uh, he was only there for like a month and I stayed for many months. And then um, that was it. And I left. And then they and then sometime later, they brought me back and they had more trouble. And like a year later, the the C, uh, the CEO uh, was kind of running around trying to get money uh, to keep it going because they had run out of money. Mm-hmm. They were in big trouble. And uh, the the chairman of the board, a very, very famous attorney in China, uh, who and we, we we grew to like each other and trust each other. And he said, you got you know, got to bail me out of this. This is terrible. Yeah. And he said, I've raised money from all my professional contacts. So I came out and then I uh, basically became uh, sort of the, under, I, well, I was the CEO. It was a publicly listed company. And I met okay. the board at the jockey club and they approved it. And hmm. uh, it was never announced to the press, but I was running the place. And so, um, and then I finished the film. And I was flying to Australia to do the post-production and to Hollywood to re-record. We had Mark Hamill as one of the voices. And uh-huh. um, it is crazy four or five month uh, post-production process. And we get it done. And that was the end of that. And I was radicalized to China, though, by that time. I said, oh, my God, this is fantastic. Yeah. But I was, even though I worked in the mainland in Shenzhen, the company was headquartered in Hong Kong. And everybody who I interacted with was really Hong Kong Chinese, which is yeah, completely different. different from the mainland. Right. Exactly. You know, and yeah, in Hong Kong, they believe in contracts and uh, they do things in a business. <laughs> so in, a, in a way, their business culture is, is, is quite close to international standards. Exactly. Uh, and that was cool. And then um, like a, almost a year went by and I was back in the States and I was uh, did some consulting. I, I, I made a couple of trips over with other producer friends uh, to try and, you know, help them out with some some things. And uh, somewhere along there. Uh, I met folks from Xingqing and Becky Bristow, who was at the time, she was a partner in the company, a junior partner. And their partner was uh, uh, Li Fang Wang, who was right. a, uh, a Chinese. And anyway, so um, yeah, Becky I, was. I, I know him. I knew him. She, oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, Becky is the chair of the animation department at Cal Arts, which is like the Harvard B School for animation. Yeah. And she was there and she said, Steve, come and stay. And I did. And then, you know, uh, it was a very different situation. It was an extremely different situation. <laughs> and it was more like typical top down, yeah. uh, absolute authority vested in one person, uh, regardless of background. And um, so that and so we ran it. And then uh, the three of us tried to get a, you know, to make it happen um, as a feature film company. So we got a, I got a couple of TV shows on air uh, and um we did some outsource work uh, for, you know, at, we did some shots for Twilight and a number of other films. And so, uh, you know, they did as well as most mainland companies can do, because, right. you know, at the end of the day, they're not going to turn to the West and say, OK, you figure out a plan, you manage the plan, you do the plan. And so China would rather really do it with mistakes, however long it takes than to turn it over to Westerners. That's just a sad reality right. in the country. Well, also, and, 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 uh, they're pay- and they're paying for the learning experience, too, which is something that, that uh, I mean, I, I, you know, my original podcast, Big Fish in the Middle Kingdom, has talked to a lot of the top professionals working here. If I would known you previously, I would have roped you into that if we had overlapped. And I also yeah. do a show called How China Works with a Chinese co-host where we dissect every – like why yeah. why do things work the way they do? <laughs> you know, like where do these cultural things come from? And so this is something that's coming out of my ears and that I, I lecture about and I consult about. So I, I get it. But for the sake of the audience, it's uh, – yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, a, it's a very esoteric topic if you're not China-focused. But if you – are then you're nodding with everything that basically uh, Steve says right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, and, you and, understand you know, and, everything he's saying, and you can read into the read into this a lot. Yeah, and Kevin, you know, uh, Geiger, Kevin Geiger, you know, yeah, certainly right. He knows the drill. We, you know, we work together. He came over to Shingshan. We try to do things. He's a friend, and um, you know, uh, he. I was always impressed that he was willing to say these things while he was there, yeah. which I elected not to do to it. would just, you know, we would have poisoned, uh, already difficult situations. Well, Ke- and, and for just disclo- cause people don't know Kevin, Kevin Geiger, he's ex Disney and Burbank, uh, started on the artistic side and he's ex, uh, exec on Disney China. 
And he's actually one of my, one of my best friends. He's been on my other podcasts, uh, several, several times. We have a recurring check in feature once a month on one of my shows. And Kevin is, 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 he is actually an, an executive producer now on my current feature that we're developing. Mm. He's, he's joined us as an EP officially as okay. about a week and a half ago. So a little disclosure on all that. Cool. Well, uh, so Kevin, you know, certainly then, and Rob Kane was, now he wasn't over in Beijing, although he spoke Mandarin and lived in Hong Kong mm. when he was quite a bit younger. He was traveling back and forth trying to be one of those guys that could be a bridge. And he comes from the finance side, really. Right. Although I guess he writes screenplays too. But mm. Rob Kane had a, uh, had a, uh, a blog. Um, that really said things that you couldn't, you know, it would be the end of your career in China. Exactly. If you were, if you, if you were, uh, spoke about the things he spoke about. I've interviewed Rob about. as well with, with Rob being in LA. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I saw him not too long ago, yeah. back of, oh, geez, about eight months ago. I had joined Xing Xing in 2007 and with the goal of doing feature films. Uh, helping them get to be able to do that. And they were starting with outsource and we're building from there. And, uh, and so then around 2012 or 2013, I created a, a story, uh, and then a screenplay that we wanted to do. I had another screenwriter, Dave Freeman. He came in and worked with me for a bit towards the end. And then I had a animated screenplay called Smart. And at that point, I, uh, uh Xing Xing moved me back to Los Angeles. And uh, we then hired uh, a director, uh, John A. Davis, who was the creator of Jimmy Neutron um, and also did uh, the Ant Bully for uh, Tom Hanks's company, Playtone. And a very nice guy. Mm -hmm. Had had his own studio, very capable, and uh, he loved the script. So then we set up a – in Burbank, I moved into Pasadena, and in Burbank I set up a uh, pre-production story room. And that consisted of a uh, production designer, editor, uh, uh, five or six uh, a story uh, uh, artist, storyboarders, and a head of story. And John and me and a, a production assistant or two. And uh, for the next 10, 11 months, um, we started to create the story reels. And mm -hmm. during that time, they were trying to sell the movie. And uh, ultimately, for... So a way longer story and for which I don't have all the answers, we were unable to uh, get it funded. And okay. so the Chinese, Xing Xing, um, uh, was getting tight on funds. And so we just, it just ended. It just shut it down. It was very, very sad. I'd spent a lifetime to get a feature going. Have uh, And we spent, you know, uh, probably a couple of million got spent or more. Wow. So it was a real deal. And, you know, we had, a, you know, John is uh, WGA, he's a writer's, he's a, he's a director's guild. It was all a straight ahead, real production, budgeted around $24 million. Mm -hmm. And uh, that ended. And then uh, I stayed with Xing Xing about another seven or eight months. And that was brings me to 2017, I guess, in the middle. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I was on, and then I was an orphan. Okay. And, uh, okay, what do I do now? And it happened, cause it happened kind of, you know, certainly it was, it was I had not anticipated, uh, this kind of conclusion. Sure. And, sure. uh, so then I was out getting, and so for the last few years, I, I decided, okay, I'm going to put time and energy into my own properties again. And some of them will be DIY if I have to. Um, you know, because that's kind of what's happening in the industry, both for book publishing and YouTube for, uh, you know, creating comedy shows or what have right, you. Right. And, uh, at the same time working down on the mainstream. And so that's kind of what I've been doing. And I've had, you know, I did manage to pull together, uh, a couple of, uh, fairly long projects, but they were in Asia. Uh, they were in China, I should say. And, um, uh, they encountered the same problems. They would go for some period of time. It looked like I'd have a two or three year gig. And then, uh, the company would fold its tents and or uh, someone would look at something. Uh, they would look at the project and say, well, you know, we're just not going to do this anymore. Yeah. Lost our interest. Each one was a unique ending. And so uh, that, uh, you know, and that sort of brings me to today when I'm bringing out a YA novel mm -hmm. and I have an animated show on air. Uh, which is kind of uh, a little fun thing that I do, and uh, and then feature projects, and I'm about to direct uh, for uh, for another screenwriter. Uh, she wrote a terrific, really one act play, uh, mm -hmm. turned it into a short, 
Maybe, I guess maybe it started as a short, but anyway, it's like a one act play, mm-hmm. all day, all the character driven. And uh, I'm, you know, directing that probably in the next six to eight weeks. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. And, and, and uh, you mentioned you have a, an animated show on the air. Did I hear you? right? Well, there? yeah, it's uh, called Nancy X. Uh, it's on YouTube. Uh, there's been absolutely zero promotion. So it only a few hundred people have seen it. Uh, and I haven't had time to do anything with it. But at this point, YouTube is over. As yeah. a way to yeah. uh, virally do anything, sure, uh, it, it's too much, it too much noise. For, yeah, it's it's over for now. I mean, it, really, this was true almost three years ago. Sure, uh, and I, I know a couple of the top influencers in the world, and they said they could never do today what they did. You know, like to get established uh, in the first place. Six years ago. Yeah. So, uh, so it means you need to have a fair amount of money to launch things. So it's really just like a, it's almost like to me a site to show your stuff. Now, you know, if I were to keep at it long enough and uh, be running around making relationships with other influencers and uh, I might be able to get up. But for me, I would rather just uh, have enough episodes that I can go over to Netflix or Hulu, whoever happens to be, or or even Jeffrey Katzenberg's uh, mobile driven. Mm -hmm. Right. uh, His new new jam. uh, Um, And so that's that. So I have, uh, you know, and then I've got scripts. So. Um, but I had a job at the beginning of this year. And again, it was supposed to be like a year and a half in China and it, uh, ended after four weeks. So I, right now I'm uh, scrambling a little bit to, uh, find out what the next thing is going to be because I need money to, and these DIY things, yeah, you know, you can do a DIY book or anything, you know, you don't, it's, it's 5,000 won't do it. 10,000, you're going to need 15 or 20 or $25,000 to have even a remote shot. Yeah at uh, breaking through in some way. And, uh, you know, I can create uh, art materials and videos and things much more easily than most people at a higher level than they would normally do for a YA book. Sure. But, uh, you know, that only takes you so far. So that's kind of where I'm at. And I'm, um, you know, I would uh, like to see if I could uh, get another gig in China um, for, for, uh, with a stu- I have a friend who's got a studio there who's doing interesting work, and um, if he brings on another project, I would probably I would go over there. But I, w- I wouldn't do anything like a year and a half or a year. You know, I would want it to be six months to a year, or something like that. Yeah, I, I uh, as I I obviously can relate to this really specifically, and and part of why I created this show was to have a non China focused podcast because my other two are in are in that world. But yeah. because of this is the world I've been living in so much and just coincidence of, of the, the merging of the worlds, even though I've three of my interviews from L.A. have been with people who have big China connections. So I've also, you know, cross posted them on the on the Big Fish in the Middle Kingdom show because it's for, you know, for China yeah. files and, and yours. I will I will likewise I will cross post this on that other show, cool. uh, which is also a lot more established so that that'll that'll help more people to hear the story. You mentioned this. I mean, you've had this incredible career and. You know, with the ups and downs and the sideways, and again, I rel- I I get it. I relate to it directly and through all the people I know who've also built a career. Because most careers, I mean, there aren't there aren't all as fortunate to have the highs, but and some have yeah. even lower lows and 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 everything in between. But this is a con. This is a consistent thing for most people. How do you personally approach dealing with these with the challenges and adversity and the things? How how do you you know, keep, keep on trucking and reframe and regroup and move forward. How do you, how do you, how, how, how are you wired to do this? Because you clearly, you know, like not taking no for an answer and have pulled your own string yeah. to move yourself forward. How, how do you approach uh, these things? Well, look, it, this is a business of uh, disappointments and the, the <laughs> entertainment press, which is pervasive, There's our pull uh, quote is the all end. about, oh, so-and-so got this deal. <laughs> they got this deal. But if you really know anything and you dig below the surface, and you, these things went on for years yeah. to get started. And, the, and every right and people, celebrities don't come on and talk about really all the ups and downs, a little sure. bit if they're challenged on it because sure. it's a good story here and there, but they don't talk about the week by week, month by month nonsense that goes how many ro- roles they try out for all right. that's kind of invisible. Exactly. So that you got you be prepared. That's what the industry is about. And um, uh, the way I, I, I have one solution always for this, which mm-hmm. is to create. And uh, I, the actual act of uh, doing a script 
uh, doing storyboards, uh, creating marketing materials, even uh, concept paintings. I lose myself and get excited in the thing. And uh, that uh, is, is a little bit of a Now, it doesn't necessarily solve the problem of, you know, getting another gig going. Mm-hmm. But uh, that has been my go to place because they think about it. I mean, uh, the first big success I had was doing light shows because I went and I literally pounded on the door, stage door and said, I, I want to learn this. And right. then I had something on SNL. And everybody told me not to do it. So I just did it anyway and brought it to them. But it was the thing I created. And, uh, you know, I did the same thing with a book. And then I did the same thing in 2000. I made a, a short called protest and it won awards all over the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably was probably the most awarded short of its, of its, uh, of that year. Mm-hmm. And, um, so that's what I do. I mean, you know, right now, uh, you know, after this other gig just kind of disappeared underneath me. Well, of course I'm out calling people and saying, Hey, I'm available. Can we do this? What are you up to? What's happening? Uh, I'll throw my hat in the ring for, you know, as a producer, do you need anything done? And now uh, I might, you know, my circle of, uh, net, my, my, my network of friends and relationships. So I've already started, I've been doing that. And, mm-hmm. uh, and usually that can that can take anywhere because of the rate at which I get paid kind of what I do now. I can't right kick back and, you know, I have to. Unfortunately, the number is pretty high because I've got a family to take sure, care of. And sure. A senior mom and all that jazz. So uh, that becomes a consideration. But, you know, in the network, it could take five, six, seven months to get another gig of a kind that really will pay me what I need. Right. So in the off hours, there's only so much you can do with the networking. Uh, on the off hours, I am creating things, you know, and, I'm, and I always have a list of things I've got to get to. So I have a right now I don't have a lot of I've been doing animation for so long. I need more live action and I love writing for live action. Mm-hmm. So I have uh, uh, a couple of projects I'm going to push forward there. I have a TV show and I may bring to a very well-known screenwriter uh, producer who to see if he wants to go in on it with me. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's that kind of, and you know, and, and that stuff is, uh, you, sh- you show your stuff a lot and you get turned down a lot, but uh, that's, that it's a numbers game. With the book, with the 25th anniversary edition of shot by shot, let's, let's not be remiss and talk about that for a moment before we land the plane here. Yeah. What were, what was your, what, what were, what was your primary focus going into the updated edition of the book? And what, how do you feel about it having it out there in the world now? Yeah. Well, uh, for many, many years, uh, I, I was kind of irritated by the fact that I had written about production technology that was digital. And even by 2000, which is now 19 years ago, yeah, at least half of that stuff was, or even more was obsolete. Right. And, uh, now it's, it's, it's now it's not only is it obsolete, but many of the people who even use those kind of tools have never even heard of some of the things Mm -hmm. they've been gone so long. So, um, that was one thing we had to fix. And I also put up a website called shot by shot And it's, it's, it is open to the public, but it's just getting started. And that was a way to be able to do something that I could update you know, uh, more frequently and it'll have a lot of storyboards and mm-hmm. stuff about gear. and not all that stuff is up there. The, the storyboard galleries, the famous directors and storyboard artists and concept painters, uh, you know, that's uh, beginning to be populated. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so, uh, going in, I, uh, I felt that I wanted to, uh, yeah, certainly update some of the storyboards. You know, uh, it, it, it's hard to imagine, but he, when I wrote the book, uh, including Orson Welles and Citizen Kane, some of the classic movies, it was like, well, that's a no brainer. Of course, they're going to be in there. But today, you know, uh, some 30, almost 25, 30 years later, uh, the new generation, uh, Orson Welles, I heard of him. Uh, it's just not the yeah. same thing. So even though I left a lot of that, work in there because I felt it's important to do so. I did add new. So, so I have Deadpool Mm -hmm. and I have some other newer things. Right. So you really updated it for the new generation. Has, has the reception been, uh, been, been nice? Well, it's just out now. And, uh, I'll, you know, it's, it is a new version. Uh, it, it looks better because they had over the years, uh, at one point they lost (laughs) the linotronic photography, which makes up two, three hundred, pictures in the book yeah. 
And so they were Xeroxes, or not Xerox, they were photocopies of the pages of the book. I remember, and the quality, seeing, I remember seeing an edition in the store that, 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 that didn't look like the one that I had. <laughs> I went back and got all the photos, uh, the actual photography, and scanned all of them in. And then it was also had the advantage of being able to do it in Photoshop, which I didn't uh, have. It okay. was no Photoshop when I did the book. So I did that, and then also I added gray tone to many, many of the illustrations. They were just line art, and I added gray tone panels in there mm -hmm. uh, to make them pop more and be better. And then I added some new material. And uh, probably four of the chapters got almost completely rewritten, anything mm -hmm. having to do with production technology. Right. I, the second edition has enough stuff to qualify or you know, be a, a value to get a new book. Um, I still believe now at this point that the right, right way to do this has to be with video. And uh, that's a major undertaking, and I, you know, I'm not ready to do it. Someone else actually did do something I think calls Hollywood cinematography, and and it's expensive and uh, a major work. But at the same time, I wait that the presentation I didn't think was that great uh, in some ways, and so uh, it should have been a home run. I think it did it okay, uh, but uh, it's still someone could still do something. There's room to to do that over. I mean, on the site, the site is an opportunity to do that. But really, even as I put the site up and just try and get the storyboards up, the idea of, of going out uh, on weekends and uh, going to production companies and showing how car rigs work or for, you know, you're uh, you're a boom guy. So I, you know, I would have someone like yourself come out and we'd an hour and I and then, you know, staging things. Well, you know, I, I hope to do that someday, but it's not going to be 2019. Right. Well, I was a boom guy 20 years ago. I've been a producer for 17 years. So I, uh, you don't, you don't want me swinging the boom on your set. <laughs> I, probably, <laughs> I probably whack everybody. What they always said, did you hit, if you hit a lot of people, not lately, <laughs> I might start now. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of things yeah. that I'm probably no longer very good at, what is something that you wish that you were better at? Well, you know, I, uh, storyboarding, painting, concept art. Uh, I was a kid who could draw in, in school, and so I could use those skills throughout my career uh, in the analog days, let's say. And so I, I storyboard, thumbnailed, and that was just great. And I did marker comps. Marker was the preferred medium in many ways. Uh, and so... Uh, if I could take a year and a half off and sort of get my, my painting and drawing chops better in the digital realm, I do use a Wacom tablet and I do all that and that's how I create things. But, um, you know, I, I need some time where I can just do that and, and only do that because I have a number of different skills. And, uh, so I kind of miss the days when I could just do one thing mm -hmm. for three months. Exactly. And I, you know, three months wouldn't do it, but I, if I had a year to, so yeah, so anyway, I would say my, my, uh, painting drawing chops, which are pretty good. Uh, I know I have the ability to be a lot better. I just don't have time to improve. What's the, and, best? Uh, you know, some people in those kind of skills, for example, uh, you know, I, I, I don't do them for months at a clip and then suddenly I've got to do them nonstop for two and a half or three weeks. And that just doesn't cut it. It's, you know, I, I see other guys who are, I know many, many, many board artists uh, for obvious reasons, having done shot by shot, they all know me. And, uh, uh, you know, I look at the words, ah, oh, damn, I could do that if I had like a four months to, <laughs> to get, know, up, but, get up to anyway. speed, get your chops in order. Yeah, I know. And in four months, that's, I guess it's kind of ridiculous. I need a year. I need a year to really yeah. just dig into digital painting and drawing. And uh, and it's not just me merely digital. I would say the underlying drawing skills, uh, there are things I would, I, I, weaknesses I have that I would like to fix. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I can get a good painting out and get good storyboards out. And in fact, for storyboarding, you, uh, there's many people who draw way more than, they, than is needed. Mm -hmm. Right. You're really just indicating shot flow. And uh, you can get by with, uh, you know, a relatively simple, you know, as long as you can draw. And uh, but at the same time, um, uh, I would say really concept art is kind of where I would put my energies. Interesting. Stephen, last question for this uh, round one. We'll have you back on here sometime and really uh, just have a whole whole different show for people. For now, though, what's the best question about yourself that I didn't ask you? Good Lord. Um, well, that's a very good question. That's an open-ended way of saying, what would you like to say before we go? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, uh, gee, let me think about this for a second. Um, well, you didn't really ask me about, you know, uh, what are my artistic goals or why do I do this? What's the spiritual mm. kind of 
well, underpinning. Lay it, lay stuff. it on me. Lay it on me. Okay. Well, essentially, for me, my life's purpose. Because I, I, uh, I was married for a long time, but I didn't have kids, and uh, that might have sort of overlap with this. But uh, my purpose was to challenge myself and uh, my brain and my whatever art- artistic skills I have, uh, and and how they relate to the world at large. And which is why I was very proud of my little short protest because it was about uh, the disappearance of the elephant and and by implication many 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 other species. And I did in two thousand. And now today, it's so much worse than I ever could have imagined. Yeah. So much worse. And it's an absolute, it's a, it's a tragedy and it's a, a crisis and doesn't get enough um, press. But anyway, uh, to the extent that I could challenge myself uh, and, and, and do something that was positive in the world, that was my interest. And, and positive in the world could have, you know, I felt that, uh, you know, any of the great authors whether it's uh, The Great Gatsby or it's a uh, more modern novel, these things are dealing, uh, trying to be as honest and as um, uh, uh, probing uh, on important things as possible. And uh, I work more in commercial film nowadays much of the time, and some of the stuff I write is pop fiction. And even though at the very bottom I want it to be have some level of honesty, it's still escapism. Mm-hmm. So, and that's fine. There's a place for that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, I, 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 I could easily do political journalism, uh, or documentaries. That would be, I mean, I, I have things that I've written down. Okay. Why well, I could do this subject. So these are very specific things I could get to, but in a general sense, that's kind of, you know, what my life led up to. And I haven't, I haven't been able to do is anywhere near as much as I would like to do or the way I would like to do it. But, um, you know, uh, I, uh, I, you know, that's, that's where my interest lies. So, and, uh, I would like to, you know, the original shot by Shad had a hundred pages, which was really technically speaking about the neuroscience of vision mm-hmm. and perception mm-hmm. yeah. and how it relates to art. And that's a, that's probably my single biggest kind of interest I've had since I was sort of discovered it doing light shows. I did something in light shows. that sort of opened up and I didn't know at the time I had a, uh, uh, a revelation which turned out to be kind of in parallel or not or at the intersection well, I mean, it really was the key finding of neuroscience okay. um, in a very general sense uh, which is that we create the world around us mm-hmm. rather we're not just responding to it uh, what we're finding out is of course we invent half of this stuff exactly and that I mean, you know it's, putting it that way is a uh, uh, covers a lot of holes but um uh, that's kind of where we are. And, uh, I think it's going to become, it's going to be the new existentialism in another 10 or 15 or 20 years as we learn more and more about, because suddenly we're going to see things that we described in, uh, with adjectives and in sort of a philosophical way are now going to become, you know, a chemical formulas and algorithms of how the brain works. Um, so, uh, that, that not in the next decade, but 20, 30, 40, 50 years, that's really, I think what's going to happen. So, um, uh, that's something I would like to find the time to be able to, so my next big book would be on that subject would be at art and, and neuroscience. Well, you just woke up a whole part of my brain and we can, we could do a show on that. <laughs> I have a feeling yeah, that we could, we could, we could, we could, we, we could go on about this for quite a bit. This is, this is right up my alley of interest as well, actually. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, you know, and, and for me it was, uh, you know, I was doing a, I was doing a, I was going to go to Columbia university to do a. I was 20 and I was going to do a workshop or actually a presentation to the graduate school and, um, and not as a student, as a, you know, outside um, um, expert. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was going to do so we did a we we're going to do a piece on I was going to do a demonstration on on Brahms, I think it was the third symphony. And so I was doing some of the light show stuff and testing it out and building you know out what I was going to do. And there's a uh, uh, light show effect, which is uh, called Lumia. It's light, uh, uh, collimated light bounced off, uh, deformed, uh, mylar. Okay. And it produces these con these, con- these shapes that are really, uh, are coming and going. It's almost like smoke. Mm-hmm. And, uh, as I was listening to it, the music, I kept realizing that my, that I was syncing it up in my head. And suddenly, mm-hmm. even though there was no obvious place for a beat or edges or anything, um, I would see that the, the, I would look at this thing, I'd hear the music and, and suddenly it would kind of for a second or so try and, um, combine the two mm-hmm. or make mm-hmm. one. And I realized, well, wait a second. It's, there is no pattern there. 
that is really it. But but the brain is trying to impose one. And I came to the conclusion the brain d- didn't like disorder. Right. And was and that was part of pattern recognition. Mm-hmm. And so I looked at that and I said, OK, um, that's really interesting. And uh, so I sort of held that thought for some time before I encountered uh, what is now modern neuroscience. Steve, this has been fantastic. We got into so many things that I was completely unaware of. And I can't wait to talk to you again. Thank you for your time today. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I'm glad there's someone in China I have to talk to who can, uh, who can ask the right questions. And, <laughs> tell you, and I want to know about, I do want to know about your feature. So we'll, we'll wrap up and then. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep on talking. <laughs> tell me. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, man. Thank you. Take care. All right, that is the show this week. Don't forget to visit crazyinagoodway.com for the links to show notes about this episode and to learn more about my other shows. I appreciate you listening. Please rate, share, subscribe, and review if you liked it. Thanks again for listening, and I will see you next week. Thank you.